Welcome back to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode number 204. I'm here with Joel Denton. Joel, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Kyle? Fantastic. My cat is like eating my feet. I'm not sure what's going on right now, but this is going to be an interesting, interesting subject. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your time as a band director in Tennessee? We will get right back to our content, but I wanted to thank you for being such an amazing band director that you're taking your time and listening to a band director podcast. There's many options out there, and I appreciate you very much taking in this content. I hope that you understand that your students are very lucky to have you as their band director, that you're continuing to grow, and that they are going to benefit from your improved skills as a band director. You can share this episode with any band director friends or other music education friends who can learn from this content, because good pedagogy is good pedagogy. And if you could take a moment and go to thegrowingbanddirector.com and you'll be able to sign up on our Patreon platform to give at least 5 or $3 a month. And it helps the content continue to be created for you to help our profession grow. Let's go back to our scheduled episode. Yeah, uh, I started at Bull to Wasp at my entire uh, career there, uh, 37 years. And uh, it was one of those things where you just kind of bloom where you're planning. And uh, I had lots of opportunities, especially the last couple of decades of my career, to go other places. Um, but I, I had a um, culture uh, that we had developed. We had a strong relationship with our community, both school and uh, uh, general community. We had amazing support. And uh, I just... I, I had built a home. We built a home seven-tenths of a mile from my parents. We had built-in babysitters. Uh, there were just so many other values that staying at Ultawa brought, uh, provided for us. And uh, most, I think that the thing I miss most in retirement is the daily interaction with those students. Mm -hmm. And I privileged to get to work with lots of students across the country throughout the year. Um, but it's that deep relationship you can make on a daily basis with your personal students that uh, I really miss. I don't miss faculty meetings. I don't miss fundraising. I don't miss any of that. Uh, but I do miss the daily engagement with, uh, with my, my students. We were talking off air and you were mentioning how you are completely failing at being retired. So you said you're in about 90 to 100 band rooms a year. Uh, I know you're doing work with Music for All um, through leadership and culture and, and all that. Sort of how, how did your time as a band director, and you mentioned culture already, kind of lead you into this quote unquote retirement phase where you're working on culture and leadership around the country? Well, you know, when I first started, uh, uh, Ultawa was a very rural school, about 725 students. Um, Ten years later, uh, we were 1,500. Ten years after that, we were over 2,000. And so uh, in my, my development as a, a band director, and I think that's as important as the students' development, I realized that I could not be all do all. And uh, so early in my career, I started inviting friends and, and legends of our profession into my band room to learn from them. Uh, one of my favorite stories is we had legendary band directors in, in the Southeast who had left the profession and gone into fundraising. And many of them would come uh, visit me. I would, you know, they wanted us to do a fundraising program with them. And, and my, my spiel to them would always be, okay, I'll do the fundraising program after you do a rehearsal. And that way I got to watch this legend uh, teach my students uh, and learn from them. And so that was great. But the thing that really led me to leadership was the fact that we were in Chattanooga. We were a, a suburb of Chattanooga. And when, when we started, like I said, it was more of a rural suburb. And there just weren't a lot of people to bring in to work with your band program. 
So, I mean, I could get, get great people to come visit for a day, but to actually come in and do sectionals and to be able to help on the field with teaching drill and even, even to be able to teach students skills. And so uh, I realized I, I had to develop people to help me and the, the people I chose to do that with were students. I want to thank Austin Custom Brass for being a sponsor of today's podcast. Trent Austin started this wonderful shop back in the Boston area many years ago and has moved it to Kansas City. Check out their unique line of doublers instruments that are perfect for students, band programs, and players of all ages. The Austin Custom Brass Doublers Flugelhorn is their most popular selling instrument, available in five different beautiful finishes. These flugelhorns come with a case in Austin Custom Brass's Fab 5 mouthpiece. The Doublers Flugelhorn offers a quality sound, playability, and affordability. Get one for yourself or your whole trumpet section today. Call Austin Custom Brass at 816-410-0826. They are located in Kansas City, Missouri, but they ship all over the country and they're wonderful humans and great people to hang with. Austin Custom Brass works with band programs from all over the country. They can provide a bid to you today, work within your school's budget, and accept POs. Call their team today at 816-410-0826 or email at info at austincustombrass.com. And uh, those students, and uh, I, when I was asked to do a peer teaching program for Music for All, uh, my friend Gary Markham said, well, Joel, we could call it the junior staff division. I said, no, sir. And uh, he said, well, why? And I said, because staff has a connotation of you've elevated the students above the other students. And their greatest influence is because they are students in the band. They are with their peers. They can influence their peers even more. And, and I realized that early on that um, I loved my students, and they knew I did. I told them pretty much on a daily basis. Um, they knew that I was their greatest advocate, their loudest cheerleaders. I was there for them. But uh, they also knew that there was a professional, moral, ethical line that I could not cross. And so – to create more influence in the band, to, to inspire them, to motivate them to do the things we needed to do. I just taught students to be those uh, initiators of that motivation, of that inspiration, to provide leadership from within. That's, that is um, what servant leadership is about. It's about showing up for them and them not showing up for you. It's about being there for others. And if we have a motto as a servant leader, it's others, yes, others. Let it's my motto be, we're always thinking about others. And so uh, I just started teaching students and then those students would start teaching other students. And that's when we talk about culture, we talk about that later. That's how culture was produced. It was, it, it became the ex expectation in the program. It, it, it became what students strive for. And so unlike and, and, and when I'm teaching leadership across the country now, I talk about this. We had an executive leadership team, drum major, band captain, guard captain, percussion captain, administrative assistant, th those people. Uh, then we had a, then we had the uh, what we could call the Council, which would have been adding the section leaders and all, all those people in. But a leadership team in a program that averaged about 120 to 130 students, it was not uncommon for us to have over 30 students actually participating in, in the leadership team because they didn't have a title or a position that they had an interest. And so the expectation was to get on the leadership team, learn, uh, from your peers so you can take their place. And the expectation of the leaders was replace yourself. So uh, always teaching others to be prepared. And, and that's just uh, what, I, what I did. And then I got to meet great people uh, like Bob Buckner and Greg Ben, who had done the exact same thing, uh, you know, years before me. 
and who had things in place that I could borrow from, and I could steal from. I, uh, you know, I, I always tell people, borrow, steal ideas, and then convert them to how they work in your program. So um, a great example was uh, Alfred Watkins from Lassiter. Dear friend, incredible mentor, I would borrow things from Al Alfred's program. I mean, it was one of the best in the country. And then he would come work, with, especially after he retired. He's usually at Uwa six or eight times a year. And he would, he would come in, and, and one day he looked at me and said, where did you get that? I really like that. And I go, Alfred, I got it from you. And he said, well, that's not the way I did it. And I said, no, I took your idea, and I made it the Ultawa way, the Joel way. And he said, well, I like, I like it better the way you do it. Excelsior Music Publishing is proud to sponsor the Growing Band Director podcast with a roster of imaginative composers, including composers who have been featured on this podcast, such as Carol Britton Chambers. Laura Estes and Tyler R. Carey. Excelsior Music Publishing provides new music for concert band, jazz ensemble, solo and ensemble, as well as books and resources for all levels and occasions, including a large and festive selection of music for your fall, holiday, and Christmas concerts. Find your perfect next piece at excelsiamusic.com. That's E-X-C-E-L-C-I-A music.com. But it might not have worked in his program that way, you know? Yeah. But for, for us, it did. And that's the key. So um, I'll tell you a little story about Greg Ben because Greg's a dear friend. And gosh, I think he's the best of us, maybe the greatest. For people who don't know school. Greg, for people who don't know Greg Ben at Marian Catholic University, sorry, Marian Catholic School for how many years? Was it 40 years? Oh, oh no. Uh, yeah, like 45 years, yeah. uh, 40, 43 years consecutively in finals, I think. So there six or seven Grand National Championships. Uh, he, uh, and, and a lot of people hang that, but the people who really know him know that his, uh, his concert bands were incredible. And he did this without really a feeder program. So uh, right before he retired, uh, I had the opportunity to judge the band that, Illinois State, uh, there's state championships, and he had this amazing trumpet player. And I was talking to my friend Bobby Lambert, who was his assistant for several years. Bobby said, Why am I done now? I said, Bobby, this trumpet player is incredible. He said, Give me a second. And he, he says, I'm going to text you something, and I want you to listen to it. And he sends me a text with a sound file in it. And it's this trumpet player's audition into the Mary Catholic band. And uh, I can't remember what it was. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, three blind my something. I mean, it was ridiculous and it was awful. And here this kid is four years later. Sounds like he could play in the Chicago Symphony. Um, just, just miraculous. So that was Greg. So Greg took his band early to Grand Nationals, and uh, while he was at Grand, uh, when he went to Grand Nationals, he watched a band uh, from uh, from Pennsylvania get off the bus, and as they got off the bus, they went into sectionals, and every section had a teacher, an adult teacher, and, and Greg realized that he couldn't do that, so he trained students to be those teachers. And as he was telling the story, I was having him share with the peer teaching division at Summer Symposium. When he was telling the story, I was like, that's, that's exactly uh, what, what I did at UWA. I, I didn't see anyone else with all those people. I just knew I couldn't get all those people to me. And, uh, and that's, that's the whole thing about culture. Um, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, but that's the whole thing about creating that kind of culture. For, for, for me, uh, it was about providing the students in the program with other students, their peers, who could inspire and motivate to be better than they thought they could possibly ever be. 
I'm supposed to tell them that. I get paid to tell them that. I'm the band director. I'm supposed to challenge them. I'm supposed that that's my job. But when when the students are saying that to other students, it changes their world. And I could, I could give you a million examples, but maybe uh, that the best one is uh, the student showed up. I literally watched his mother get out of the car and pull him out of the car. And uh, he had a T-shirt on, had a zero on it. The kid did not want to be there. And, and we, we started calling him zero just to kind of engage him. Hey, zero, come do this. You know, he had the zero on his shirt. And uh, the next day she brings him back. And she, I watched her that day. She didn't get out of the car. She just reached over and unlocked it and said, get out. And uh, his name was Chuck. And Chuck didn't, he didn't really like band, but he liked the people in the band. And he kind of uh, made it through his freshman year. Sophomore year, he, he got a lot better. His junior year, he, well, he was getting pretty amazing. He was making region band and everything. We had one elected position in the band. I was band captain. Everybody got to vote on that. And, Everything else was uh, auditioned or or selected based on their past. And um, Chuck was elected band captain. He was the most influential uh, person in the band. And if you talk to him today, he's very successful. If you talk to him today, he would tell you that uh, other students changed his life because he had no as a little freshman, he had no purpose. He really didn't. He had no drive. Um, but when you get around other students who have an expectation of excellence and an expectation of growth and uh, of high achievement, then Chuck is what you get. You get, yeah. you get someone who changes from nothing to or, or not giving very much effort, just being really – in attendance to someone who's present, committed every day. So speaking of that growth, um, you mentioned earlier about having somebody come in and work with your band and how we were talking off air about how sometimes that can be daunting, that can be intimidating to people. They feel like they're being judged. And I, I just want to put that call out to people that when you step aside from your podium and invite somebody else in who can give something to your band, you're showing strength at that time. You're showing strength to your students you're showing your students that, as Thomas Turpin said on a podcast we did last year, that I am not the keeper of all things band. This is not something that's about me. And that that message to your band is great. Now, guess what? Your band has flaws because every single band in the entire history of the world has flaws. That's not about being perfect. But the realization that your group is not perfect and you're not perfect and you want to learn gives that information to, to your students and is huge. And I always, I've done a lot of managing of bands over my career, either district band, honor bands or all state bands. And the whole reason was I could just bring in whoever I wanted to bring in and I could sit and watch them teach for three days. And that's how I've done, you know, a ton of my growing. I, I, absolutely. And, and, you know, uh, it doesn't, we want to encourage young directors to do that, but I want to encourage seasoned directors to do it. I mean, the, the last five years of my career, R Roy and June Holder had just retired from Lake Braddock. Alfred Watkins had just retired from Lasseter. Freddie Martin was in, um, in Atlanta. David Holsinger was 15 miles up the road at the university. Uh, and, and the list goes on and on. But I say that because... Those people were in my band room on a regular basis. And after 30 plus years of teaching, I was still learning every time one of them showed up. I, I would learn something. And, uh, you know, it, it sounds cliche, but there were lots of days I learned more than the students did. And so I would encourage all uh, directors, regardless of your experience, Invite people in, get other ears on your program. Let your students hear the same things you're telling them from another voice, another timbre, uh, 
it, it's amazing. I mean, I watch band directors now. I will go in to work with a band and I will say something and the band will do it immediately. I watch the band director drop their head. Like, because, not because they didn't tell the kids to do that, the students to do that, but because they had told them and they didn't, it didn't resonate with them the same way as it did when they heard someone else say it, maybe a, a different way, uh, with a different tone. The other thing, and I loved what you, when you were talking about that, uh, I always say, hum some people think humility is a weakness. Humility is a strength. Uh, when, when you allow yourself, when you put yourself in a position where you have to show humility, you, that takes the strength of knowing that this is not going to destroy you. This is going to make you better. Uh, and in the, in the sense of service, uh, if we're going to lift people up, uh, to lift something up, you really need to get beneath it. And so uh, it, it's about lowering yourself uh, in, a, in a mindset so that uh, others can be lifted up. And I, I just encourage band directors, invite people in. Yeah, uh, I, I know invite. Dr. Dr. Tim, I heard him say once that the best leaders are mission-driven. They don't want the credit. They don't care for the credit. It takes too much time to get the credit. They're all about the mission of the kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I love I love this session we're going to do. Um, so you have a session that's called Cultivate, Creating a Perennial Culture of Excellence in an Annual World. Um, can you take a second and just kind of um, dissect what, is that, what does that phrase refer to and what does that mean? Well, uh, I... I because of all the experience I have and lots of the places I get to visit, I've watched situations where uh, band programs are recreating themselves every year. And this is true in businesses too. Bus business is starting to figure this out, uh, but um, they're, they're not there yet either. Um, but it, I go back to, and I can talk about this more later, but I go back to, if, if you plant a flower garden, you can choose to plant perennials or, or annuals. And annuals are, are flowers that you're going to plant, and they're going to bloom, but then they're going to die. And you're going to pull them out of that garden. You've got to go back the next year and replant them all again. And that's what I, I was seeing across the country, uh, even when I was teaching, but especially in these last six years, is lots of programs that, they can't figure out why they can't get to the next level, whatever that next level is for them. And it's because they're literally trying to recreate what they're doing every year. And the programs that have uh, decades of success, who have the longevity of success, like Marion Catholic or like Lassiter or like Lake Braddock, uh, and others are around the country now. Uh, I think of my friend Darren Davis of Broken Arrow and, and others that have had just, uh, you know, uh, Carmel High School um, when Richard Sosato was there, now Mike Pope. Uh, Jay, what Jay did at Avon. And, and I mean, there's just these, and I'm saying these programs because they, don't have to start over every year. They, they are a perennial uh, flower garden that uh, all you have to do is, is kind of hoe the ground a little bit. We'll get deeper into this. Hoe the ground a little bit, throw some fertilizer on it, water it, and it blooms again. And the co cool thing about that is, just like those perennial plants do, uh, when they get to a point where they, gosh, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but when they get a, uh, when they get to a point where they uh, have, have spent, they're spent, their, their lifespan's over. Uh, the cool thing is they go to seed. They produce seed, which produces more plants. And uh, that, that's, that's kind of the mindset behind this is how do you move from doing the same thing every year to creating a culture where you don't have to just like uh, 
I, I think it takes about three years to produce this kind of culture. Uh, sometimes a little longer, but about three years. We, we'll talk about that in the session, but uh, it, it's about getting to a place where your students are training students who are training students yep. who are training students. And you, it keeps going. You talk about um, that in education, we worry too much about the what and not enough about the why and the how. What did you yeah, mean yeah. by that? Well, we, we talk a lot about rigor and we talk about standards and there's all these things that we talk about. And we do it in leadership too. Uh, you know, I, I, I love Tim. Tim, Tim well, Dr. Tim is, he's a, he's, and I can say this, he's a, he's a great friend and he is, he's the reason I, I started doing this. He, uh, excuse me, stopped me in the tunnel in Atlanta at BOA Regional. 25 years ago, and said, when are you going to start telling other people what you're doing? And I said, I, I can't do that, Tim. I've got young kids, and I don't have an assistant. He said, well, there'll come a time. And about 10 years after that, uh, we went to Macy's, and we weren't competing. And so I had a fall that I didn't have to be. So uh, on top of everything from a competitive standpoint, and I started just – opening some doors and, and Tim, Tim helped me with that some and uh, we, we got where we were, but we, we talk about all these things. We talk about standards and, and rigor and, and even the leadership and, uh, of what you do. And we can have what we, I, I call leadership pep rallies. It's sometimes when people go in and they'll do like a two or two and a half hour session. And there's really not enough time to teach about, why you should do leadership and how you should do leadership. All you can really talk about is the what. So I call that a, kind of a, a leadership pep rally. I believe we should spend more time talking about the why and the how. Uh, it, because if the why is not correct, I don't think anything else matters. I think that's true in everything we teach. If there's not a, it, that the why is what keeps us going uh, on our bad days when what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it's not working. We can, the heart of the matter is why. And if we get the why right, then I think we can really uh, move to what we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it. And that's why, uh, where I think uh, backward planning becomes so important because it allows you to think about where you want to end up not just where you're starting. The, the, if, you, uh, if you go watch an opera, which I just recently really fallen in love with, if you go watch an opera, I will assure you the reason everything works so well, the, the staging, the position of the singers, uh, how they use imagery, uh, as opposed to some of the things we might do in music theater, or, or a marching band, how they use imagery in a different way to get their message across is because they thought uh, about how they want to get to things, how they what they what they want it to feel like at the end. You know, like I'll give you an example with marching band. Uh, many times uh, we get to our rivals, and the audience doesn't respond the way that we wanted them to. And it's because we haven't we haven't thought about what we needed to do to get to that moment. The way we shape into that moment tells them what to feel, how to feel it, when to applaud, and how to applaud. And if if we don't do that, it gets confusing to them. I, I equate it to you want an exclamation point uh, when you get to your arrival, but you you constructed it like a question mark. So the audience is just confused. Yep. So backward planning becomes so important uh, when we think about the what and the why. And then the how becomes uh, important because you can't spell how without spelling who. And um, who is going to produce what we want to produce and why is it important? 
And so for me, that's where the, the student comes in, is if I'm going to do this, then I have to think about who I'm doing it with. And then I can take, think about how I'm going to do it and what we're going to do. Uh, whenever, so that, that's kind of, whenever I talk to teachers who look back on a time in a school, I always ask, one of the things I asked them, I just asked Scott Rush in a, a, an episode we did this summer was, you know, what is the most important thing to you as you look back on your career? Because a lot of us are thinking about, we got to play this certain piece or we played at a certain venue or whatever. And almost to a person, everybody says relationships. They think of the people they met and the people who are in, in their lives. Um, I wanted to read some of these leading questions that you wrote about why this, of what, like some specific ways this can go to ban. I want people just to think about some of these possible leading questions um about uh what's important about your culture and how to define and ultimately measure how it might be so here are some leading questions what do we want to graduate a graduate of our program to have experienced what important character traits do we want to establish and equip our students with and are these for just now or for life here's a hint if you make it for life you're gonna be more successful and mm -hmm. in, in our teaching what attributes of an ensemble apply to real life and how are we preparing our students for their future endeavors? You know, on one of the podcasts, I forget who it was, but this person told the story of when they were a student teacher and they were student teaching with this band director who was a seasoned, effective band director. And in the office walks Johnny and Johnny says, uh, Mr. Smith, I'm going to be missing our band camp performance of of our, um, you know, of our end of summer marching band camp because I have to go to the 4-H club and I'm showing horses. And the band director said, okay, um, let's have a meeting about that. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So then he had some time with the student teacher and he said, he turned to the student teacher and said, um, how would you handle this? What would you do? And this person who's telling me the story said, well, it's very clear if they can't be there at the performance, they shouldn't be in the marching band. They're not going to contribute to what we're doing. Let's going to, you know, let's have them, this Johnny not participate. And he turned to, and this person said, I can see it as clear as day as it was yesterday. And he said, what Johnny's going to go on and he's going to live and work in agriculture. Horses are his life. Band is not his life. Band is part of what he does. By you saying he can't be in the band, you're not changing what his career is going to be. You're basically saying he's not allowed to be in the band unless band is everything for him. And he said, you really need to find a way to balance doing effective work for the band and what's really important, but also keeping in mind what's important for their life in the future. And that really struck me. I wish I, I wish I'd remembered who told me that story, but it's always stayed with me. Well, I think it's so true. And, uh, you know, um, when I'm doing leadership clinics or leadership camps with students, uh, and, and even when I'm doing honor bands, I will talk about this because one of those questions, how to, how does ensemble apply to real life? And, and I will say to them, we're going to envelop everything we do in band, but I want you to be able to take uh, these same concepts and understand they work in your life. Because it, it, in life, you're going to be on a team. I'm going to use an ensemble as a team, ensemble as a team. Well, in life, you're going to be on a team. If you want to be a doctor, You'll be in a medical team, a surgeon, a surgical team, a pilot, a flight team. You want to be a teacher, you're going to be on a grade level or subject-specific team. And it, let's face it, if you want to have a family, you're going to be on a team. Family is a team. And uh, team, the acronym, I love acronyms, uh, is together everyone achieves more. And uh, so that's that's the mindset of uh, of and this is a Dr. Tim thing that I've borrowed from him, but this is the mindset of getting us to think less about I, me, and think about us, we. It's the synergy of everyone's efforts being greater than my efforts could ever be. And what can we produce with that synergy? And for me, uh, it, it's amazing to watch every time, whether it's in a, a leadership session or, or uh, visiting, conducting a band or doing an honor band clinic, it doesn't matter. Um, I get to see the students do something they didn't think was really possible. 
uh, one of the one of the ways I uh, share this with you. One of the ways I, I love to do this is say, raise your hand. Uh, I kind of stole this from Frank Troika, but this is a uh, Joel made it Joel's, and uh, they'll raise their hand, and, and I'll say, well, look around. You're the leaders in the room. Some of you got your hands at twenty five percent. Some's got them at fifty, sixty. I said, is that the effort you want from your peers? Because you have to model for them what you want them to be. So raise your hands as high as you can, and they will. And then I'll go, now raise it a little bit higher, and they all can. And I go, see, you're all liars. What you did was comfortable. But comfortable is good, and good is the enemy of great. And so what we want to do is we want to find that little extra that moves us from ordinary to extraordinary uh, that uh, allows us to be able to achieve at a level that we never thought was possible. It's funny. I heard, I heard, I heard Dr. Tim use that, you know, that analogy once as well, but the phrase he used was when he showed that they could do even a little bit more, he said, that's what's wrong with your life. Oh, that's awesome. You know, yeah, I've like never that. heard him say, I've never heard him say that. <laughs> that yeah. it, it, you mentioned here too that um when you ask somebody to describe their program, 95% of the time, which is probably an arbitrary number, but obviously the majority of the time people say the word family. So can we discuss that word a little bit and I would have been in that 95% as well. Oh, yeah. So well, uh, the truth of the matter is that, that is a arbitrary number, meaning that it, if I ask it a hundred times, probably 97 or 98 of the students would say say that. And so when we think about family, uh, here, here are the, the things that I always ask people to think about. What are the characteristics of a loving and supporting family? Uh, it, it, you know, what, what are those characteristics? Uh, are those different than we would want in a great band or a great school culture if I'm talking to, uh, to teachers. Uh, do we create our family culture every year or does it grow and mature and blossom year after year uh, based on the love that we have for each other, the care we have for each other, the respect we have for each other? You know, um, uh, th I, this may be scripture, I can't remember, but there's something that says when I was a child, I talked like a child. Uh, but as I mature, as I grow, I get older. Well, uh, that that's so true. I mean, I, I, my son is 36, he'll be 37 in December. And I can remember having conversations with him when he was very little. And then I can have remember having conversations with him when he was in high school, he, uh, at times he was helping correct me or guide me. And, and now he has a family and children. And so now we talk almost at the same level. Uh, I have more experience than he does, and he asks for that at times. But then he's living in a society in a, a, a time that is totally different than when I was his age. And so I can talk to him and say, you know, uh, this is what's happening, How, especially like when I'm out traveling or explain to me so I know exactly what people are going through right now um, because he's, he's a much more in that, in that you know, uh, generation. And so I think that's, that's the thing is we, we don't have to create that culture of family year after year after year. It, it just... Um, it happens, and it's a wonderful culture. It's a culture that uh, reproduces itself, and, and we create expectations. And uh, I'll share this. Uh, I, I, like I said, I told my students I love them on a daily basis. Well, I told my children that I love them multiple times a day, probably. Uh, but I also would tell them I'm proud of them. And uh, when my son graduated college, uh, he told me, he said, Dad, I never doubted your love. But I think knowing you were proud of me may have been equally 
important. And uh, I think that's what culture does. A correct culture uh, creates an environment where we don't just care for each other. Uh, we don't just uh, sympathize or even empathize with each other, but we are constantly supporting and helping and encouraging uh, each other as well. I, I love it when you use that word proud. That's something that I want to work on because I think it's natural as a band director to, to always be thinking about the things that are wrong, right? This release and this attack and this dynamic and this tempo and what, like we're in this constant mode. So being able to quote unquote, just focus on what's good and be proud of something without saying, yeah, but here's 15 things I wish were different. That, that is something I'm definitely working on. And I love that story that you mentioned about how important that was um, to your son. And I just want to reiterate a quote you said, because there's a part of it that you left out when you said it. And I wanted to, because I think this is the reason why I love this quote so much. You said, a wonderful culture is a culture that reproduces itself and promotes excellence through relationships. And that there's yes. the key right there, that it's about your relationship with everybody in that band program and their relationship to each other that will help promote that excellence. Absolutely. So, Joel, you use the word cultivate through this presentation. Um, I'm sure that's an acronym. Tell us about that. So the, the C is care, the U is understand, the L is listen. And as I tell student leaders all the time, listen, listen, listen. Listen a lot. We're really good at talking, but if we'll listen lots of times, uh, our peers or our students will tell us what they need. The T is for trust. Trust is the foundation of everything we do in leadership. Um, but if we haven't developed a relationship through care, understanding, and listening, then uh, people won't trust us and people don't follow people. They don't trust. Uh, the I is for invest. And, and that means we're going to make an emotional investment, uh, but we're also going to make a time investment. We're, we're going to invest in this relationship that we have with our peers or our students. The V is for value. And, and value means that they have to feel valued. They, they have to know it, it really goes back to caring for them, but it's it's bringing uh, something to them that they didn't know they had or they deserved. Uh, so so many people in our society don't think they're enough, and what we need to get our students to understand is that they are enough. And understand that some students need band more than band needs them. And we still need to value them because we may be the place that changes their lives for the future. The uh, A stands for applaud. That's a, another word for praise. Uh, we need to uh, applaud for them often. I do an exercise where it's called applaud like you'd like to be applauded for, where students practice applauding for each other. We talk about that and how empowering it is to applaud for someone and what it feels like and how it is empowering also when people applaud for you. And then the, the, the T, the second T is team, and that's us, we, not I, me. It's together, everyone achieves more. And then the E is empower. Uh, I could have used the word enable there, but I like empower because I'm giving you permission to be more than you thought you could be and, and uh, to really show you were uh, absolute very best qualities. So when we look at the, the flower garden, because we, we, we said creating a perennial culture of excellence in the annual world, uh, the flower garden requires these things. So uh, when we get ready, and this, this might be what the first year kind of looks like a little bit, uh, the flower garden requires that we plow the ground and then we hoe it. That means we're going to break up all the, the dense pieces. We're going to get the rocks out. And then we're going to dig the holes. In other words, we're preparing the environment uh, through caring, understanding, and listening to begin really deepening and creating uh, relationships. Uh, the second part of, 
of planting a garden requires that once you get it plowed and hoed and dug, get the holes dug, and then you got to plant the, the plants and you got to, you need to fertilize them and you need to water them. That's our environment. That's, that's where the environment starts really coming in. Uh, we produce a deepening of relationships through developing trust, investing in uh, our students and our peers, and in valuing the members of our environment, of our culture. And then ultimately, the plants will start to bloom, multiply, and recede. So in, in our culture, that, rep that happens through us applauding them, through praising their efforts, through our teamwork, through recognizing the greatest beauty and excellence is produced by the differences of our members and their abilities coming together, that synergy. And, and when we look at the flower garden, we don't see individual flowers. We see a bouquet of flowers. We look at our culture. We should see a bouquet of students, each one bringing unique beauty and unique skills and unique abilities to our program. And some of the most beautiful bouquets are when your most advanced students start working with students of lesser skills and seeing the growth and seeing them really start to bloom. Uh, it's like when you buy a bouquet of flowers or you pick up one at the florist and some of the flowers haven't opened yet, but the buds are there. They just haven't, they just haven't opened. But as you water them and as you keep that fertilized in the vase, the vase, uh, you start to see those flowers uh, start to bloom. And then ultimately by empowering them to reproduce themselves, to become the model for their peers. Uh, that's so incredibly important because uh, just like in my grandmother's flower gardens, we would transplant flowers. We would move them from one place to another because they got too big for that particular garden or they were getting spent and they needed to move on. They had, they had done all they could do for that particular flower garden but they usually, uh, when they got spent, they, they seeded. So new, uh, new plants, baby plants would start to grow. And that, that reminds me of uh, we want to get to a place with our students where they're prepared to go on, to move on. Uh, they're going to graduate. They're going to go to college or go to a career. We want them to take the skills, uh, the attributes of band with them to produce in the other areas of, of their life. And we want them to reseed by leaving their legacy in the program. One of, the, one of the most beautiful things for me was watching students bring in students and point at this student and say, he was the first freshman soloist to ever play the alma mater at the University of Tennessee at halftime. He was a soloist. That student was a soloist with the uh, Blue Devils, that student uh, is the director of the Carolina Guard now. And, and just on and on. And they didn't know those students. The students even introducing the young students or showing those students weren't there when those students were there. But the legacy that they left behind was still there and it was still producing beauty uh, in our culture. And, and that's what Cultivate is. It's it's about realizing that uh, we have an opportunity to create something that if we do it correctly, will reproduce itself over and over again. I love that. And Joel, you mentioned here um, one of the things you talked about modeling. And to me, when I think of modeling, um, it's really like who is the leader themselves? What do they do every day? What do they show in the, how they live their life? That I think speaks more than anything else um, to your students as as you lead them and in view, you have motivate and observe and demonstrate and educate and lead. Um, these are these are all effective ways that we can um, that we're going to model for our students. Can you give us a quick rundown of that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, motivation and observation require relationships. So the first uh, steps of leadership uh, are to develop a relationship with your peers, get to know them 
because you can't inspire people you don't know, people don't listen, people they don't know. Uh, you want to be able to observe them so you know if they're having a bad day. Uh, observation is the first step to understanding that we talked about uh, in Cultivate. The demonstrate is we want you to demonstrate the kind of people you should be and the kind of band members you should be. Uh, I think great people make great band members. Great people produce great music. If we focus more on the person, the band side takes care of itself. And then the educate, and this is a challenge for student leaders particularly, is you have to be able to evaluate and quit. There's two things there in educate. You can't just tell people they're doing something wrong. You have to also be able to tell them how to fix it. Mm. And, and if, if you do those four steps, motivate, observe, demonstrate, educate, then I think the, the sum is you can lead. If any of those are missing, I'm not sure you can be an effective leader. I love that, Joel. Thanks so much. Um, so as we close out, and again, I appreciate your time very much on the podcast today. Yes. Um, is there a piece of music or composer you think more band directors should be aware of and perform with, they, with their students? Uh, there, there's so many great, great composers. I, I, I'll leave you with a few. I think, uh, you know, if you want to get uh, deep music, and I'm talking more contemporary stuff now, um, Maslanka is a great, great place to, to go for uh, getting students to understand heart in music. If you want to experience some levity and joy in music that um, uh, students can relate to, and, and sometimes her music includes... Uh, famous uh, operas or famous uh, uh, orchestral things. I think Julie Giroux's music is, is absolutely wonderful. Uh, my friend Brian Balmages writes lots of great music at all level. Um, and, uh, you know, Randall Standridge uh, writes lots of music, but, but I'm finding that lots of his music gives us opportunity to really help students fall in love with making music and playing their instruments. And once they do that, then we can take them to even uh, deeper, uh, more uh, advanced musical skills. I'm not saying that Randall's music doesn't do that, just saying that a lot of it is, I think, particularly good for younger students to help them really find out the joy of playing the instrument, the joy of music. Joel, thank you so much. Um, this episode has been full of amazing advice for band directors. Is there one, maybe one final piece you'd like to leave us with? Um, I'll, I'll leave you with two quotes. Um, uh, servant leadership, and, and this is from me, servant leadership comes from a position, from a position of the heart. It's not a result of intellect. Uh, we teach the fruits of this type of heart, but the seeds must be planted in our hearts first. You can't give what you don't have. And so if we want to cultivate, then we need to be practicing cultivating in our own lives as we teach it to others. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.